Do you want to have a cheeky Pokemon fight? He's the Pope Catholic, you cheeky tart. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking, and welcome to the final entry in the upgrade. Oh crap, go back. I said go back trilogy. Not to mention the final episode of series one. Stay tuned for a special sneak peek at what the next series is going to be. Without further ado, let's wrap up this series until November and give it everything we've got. This is my review of Pokemon Sword and Shield. Much like how I didn't cover Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon in my review of Generation 7, I will not be talking about the two DLC packs, the Isle of Armor and the Crown Tundra, in this episode. Make a game worth the sale price, then we'll see about charging for DLC. Sword and Shield really had a lot to live up to. Other Nintendo staples like Mario and Zelda had already made huge waves with fantastic and innovative games on the Nintendo Switch, while all Pokemon had was a tie-in to their mobile game. And let's just say it, uh, failed in basically every aspect. For starters, the Gala region freaking sucks. The Gala region is based on the United Kingdom, which is a pretty linear-looking country. So Game Freak decided to use this as an excuse to make practically the entire region a straight line. Even when there are the occasional offshoots, there's maybe, like, two, it always ends with you heading back where you started and following the straight line again. And it wouldn't be that big of a problem if the towns and cities were actually interesting. I recall absolutely nothing about any of the locations in Galar, aside from having dumb names like Stow on Side and Balan Lee. They're all so bland, basic, and boring because Game Freak decided to pump all of their development time into the stupid ass wild areas. Big open areas that separate different parts of Galar where you can see wild Pokemon roaming the world and occasionally participate in Dynamax battles, but we'll get there. The wild areas would have been much cooler if we didn't just have a game where Pokemon are visible on the overworld at all times, not in just certain areas. And while I'm on the topic of Let's Go being better than these games, why do Sword and Shield look worse? They had an extra year of development time! Anyway, after your first or second time in a wild area, the awe factor wears off and fast. Just like with Dynamaxing. Oh Dynamaxing, is there anything you're actually good for? Dynamaxing and Dynamax battles are the new big gimmick of Generation 8, merging Gen 6's Mega Evolution and Gen 7's Z moves to create an unholy abomination that loses its luster very fast. Unlike Mega Evolution, every Pokemon is capable of Dynamaxing, which basically means they get really big, get a stat boost, and have access to stronger moves. But certain Pokemon can take on a special look when they Dynamax, and that's called Gigantamax. But it's not universal, no. <laughs> That would be too easy. Instead, a Pokemon in a species that is capable of Gigantamaxing has to have the Gigantamax factor, otherwise it will just do regular Dynamaxing. Basically, it's another dice roll to add as you attempt to get a Pokemon with the right nature and ability. Moving on from one crap gimmick to another, Sword and Shield carried on the new trend of having regional variants, this time called Galarian forms. However, they took it a step further. Now, certain Pokemon that didn't have evolutions now have Galarian forms with evolutions. There were also some Galarian forms that just got different evolutions, like Meowth usually evolves into Persian, but Galarian Meowth evolves into Perserker instead. Other Galarian forms that got new or different evolutions were Galarian Farfetch'd getting Surfetch'd, Galarian Corsola getting Cursola, Galarian Linoon getting Obstagoon, and Galarian Yamask evolving into Runarigus instead of Kofagrigus. Fun fact about Kofagrigus, if you give it a nickname, it's the only Pokemon who can't get its original name back. The naughty no-no word detector in the games picks up on a certain three-letter word in the name and doesn't allow it. Now, I'm all for older Pokemon getting new evolutions, especially Pokemon that really need one, but I hate that it's locked to certain regional variants that you most likely won't see in any other game without trading. I think overall the Galarian form designs are better than the Alolan form designs, but the only ones I really like are Ponyta and Rapidash because they remind me of the last unicorn. However, the Galarian forms crippled Darmanitan with the awful Gorilla Tactics ability, which is like regular Darmanitan's Sheer Force ability, but one-fourth as good. Speaking of new Pokémon, god a lot of the Gen 8 Pokémon suck, like Fat Squirrel, literally just a fox, literally just a sheep. The Big Pain! The Tea Kettle, get it? Because it's in the UK! The Hat Rack! The thing that Gigantamax is into a literal building! The design that looks unfinished! The Monkey from the Amazing World of Gumball! And Big Brain Time! The starters aren't much better either. Your choices are the fire type everyone was convinced was going to be the fourth fire fighting type, Score Bunny! The water type everyone loved until they saw its evolution, Sobble! and the grass type that people picked for the memes, Grookey. In terms of base forms, they aren't bad, but when they evolve, the f***ing wheels fall off. Sobble evolves into an emo twig, Grookey evolves into hipster Donkey Kong, 
and Score Bunny evolves into another bipedal humanoid bunny, but one that likes soccer. As for which one I picked and what team I managed to scrape together with the very limited selection we were given, which is a controversy for another day, I used the Fire-type Cinderace, the Flying Steel-type Corviknight, the Psychic Fighting-type Gallade, the Water Rock-type Dreadnaw, the Electric Poison-type Toxtricity, and the Grass Ice-type Abomasnow. Not my favorite team ever, but they got the job done. But then again, I probably could have used six freaking sheep and they would have gotten the job done because this game is as hard as simple addition is to a TI-84 calculator. But that's enough complaining about the new gameplay stuff, it's time to move on to this game's plot. Let's take a look. Huh. That's... unfortunate. Yeah, these games have no story. You just follow the straight lines of the gallery region to complete the gym challenge with your rival, Hop, whose entire character is that he sucks at Pokemon, so at least they're self-aware. One of the two things about Sword and Shield I like is the presentation of the gym challenge. I like how it's treated like an actual sport, complete with collectible trading cards, uniforms, even though a lot of them look stupid, and a stadium full of people ready to watch the battle, even though the stadium thing was just an excuse to allow Dynamaxing. With so much put into the presentation of the gym challenge, surely the gym leaders must be just as good, right? Well, let's find out. The fighting grass-type farmer who just wants to have fun and not go all out, making him a terrible gym leader, Milo. The raging water-type wave who has lifesavers on her shoes, meaning her feet would float to the top and she'd be turned upside down, which last I checked will lead to the opposite of what lifesavers are supposed to do, Nessa. The ever-burning gym leader of fire who looks about as done with life as I am with this game, Kamu. In sword version only, the Galar fighting-type gym leader prodigy who joins the Maylene Club of Gym Leaders prominently featured on AnimeFeet.com, real website by the way, B. B's shield version counterpart, the silent ghost type gym leader of mystery who is definitely going to grow out to be a serial killer and shouldn't be given this platform, Alistair. The fairy type gym leader of fantastic theater who uses her gym challenge to look for a successor because she's old as f years old, Opal. Your kind of rival but not really who eventually becomes Opal's successor, Bead. In Sword Only, the hard rock, well, rock type gym leader who had a falling out with his mother because of type choices or whatever, Gordy! Gordy's shield counterpart, the ice cold professional ice type gym leader, and also Gordy's mom, making her fit a very specific category that we're all thinking, but I'm not gonna say it. Melanie! The dark type gym leader and human evolution of Gladion from Sun and Moon, who we'll talk about more a bit later. Piers! Another rival kinda, but not really, that we bully into becoming a gym leader by whooping their ass several times when she takes over for peers and also, Fan Art Central, Marnie! The gym leader of dragons who continues to throw a storm at the champion despite constant losses, Raihan! Finally, Hop's older brother who avoided death by baseballs by going into the sport of Pokemon battling and becoming Galar League champion, Leon! Usually in every gym league, no matter how good they are in general, I can say something positive about at least a few of them. But I just can't hear. They all suck. Some of them had interesting gimmicks like Opal quizzing you mid-battle or Raihan's fight being a double battle, but none of the characters themselves were interesting. As for the kinda rivals but not really, I never classified Beat as a rival because he isn't around nearly enough, and Marnie is more or less this game's evil team leader, Team Yell. Team Yell is officially led by Piers. I know in my first review I used a photo of Marnie, Piers' younger sister, when I was showing all of the future evil team leaders I would talk about. But Team Yell is obsessed with Marnie and does everything without Piers knowing, so who is really in charge? Plus, Team Yell sucks anyway, so I just don't care. They aren't even evil, just annoying. But just like in Sun and Moon, it turns out that the evil team isn't actually the main threat. It's actually the rich CEO of a successful company who ends up being an antagonist, which will hopefully never be repeated again, Chairman Rose. Another character I guess you could classify as a twist villain, even though you see him like twice the whole game, and then all of a sudden he's about to destroy the world by summoning Eternatus and creating another Darkest Day. The original Darkest Day took place roughly 3,000 years prior and occurred when Eternatus attempted to absorb Galar's energy, releasing Dynamax and Gigantamax energy in the process, until he was defeated by Zacian and Zamazenta, the box art legendaries. Basically, Rose's plan is to provide a near-infinite energy source for the Galar region by by destroying the Galar region. Did it, Patrick. We saved the city. 
In truth, he thinks he can control the power of Eternatus and convert it into energy, but it's his dumb fault for thinking he can control evil space hand. Speaking of Zacian and Zamazenta, they suck! They're just two more legendary dogs that honestly look kinda stupid. And speaking of stupid looking legendary Pokemon, the two expansion packs added quite a few more. You've got Kung Fu Panda, aforementioned monkey, two new legendary titans for some unknown reason that were completely unnecessary. And seriously, why isn't it just Reggie Electric and Reggie Ragon? It sounds so much better that way. Two rejected My Little Pony characters, the Napoleon Pokemon, Napokeon, and Napokeon on a horse. But to end on a positive note before we wrap things up, I want to mention the other thing about Sword and Shield that I actually liked. Professor Magnolia. Now, the character herself isn't anything special, but I liked the story they told during the game, and I honestly didn't see the end result coming. Throughout the story, you are accompanied by Sonia, the professor's granddaughter who doesn't know what she wants to do in life, but finds herself drawn to the legends behind the darkest day. Eventually, her experiences with you as you discover more behind the legends and stop Chairman Rose lead to Sonia writing a book on it, which gets her recognized as a professor, and Magnolia steps down and has Sonya take her place. It's a pretty simple story, all things considered, but I like that they actually had a side character with development that doesn't just end with them leaving you. Plus, it was nice to see how someone actually becomes a Pokemon professor in this world. And I just like Sonya, okay? Overall, Pokemon Sword and Shield are, without a doubt, the worst Pokemon games I have ever played. And that's saying something. I played one of the Mystery Dungeon games. The updated graphics and new gimmick were just smoke and mirrors to try and hide just how little there was to this game beneath the surface. And it wasn't even thick smoke or clean mirrors. The smoke was thin and sad and the mirrors were more like windows because everyone saw right through them. It exposed Game Freak as an ass backwards studio that retires mechanics people love and replaces them with inferior versions all for the sake of innovation and the flaws in their more is more mindset. 3 out of 10. Man, what a sour note to end this first series on. Well, I guess it isn't technically over since the game series is still ongoing, but it's definitely taking a break. Now I'm free to talk about any game by any studio, and next time we go in a completely different direction, free from Nintendo's influence when we look at a game first released on the Nintendo DS. Well, you just have to wait and see what the future holds, but the numbers don't lie. And I know one incredibly evil and twisted man that would like the name of this game. This is your captain speaking, and I hope to see you there.